Friends, good morning. Gathered now, wherever you may be, I invite you to bow your head with me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful, O Lord, on this day as we commemorate the appearance of the star over Bethlehem, as we commemorate, O Lord, the coming of the wise men in acknowledgement of your birth, the revelation of your life to the Gentiles. Grant now, Lord, that your word may be written in our hearts, that it may change and transform our lives, that we may receive your light into our lives and follow you faithfully all the days of our life. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, I want to share with you this morning some words from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, reading from verse 5 to verse 6. There Paul writes, In former generations this mystery was not made known to humankind as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. The Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. During my preparation for confirmation, just as we will in a few short hours prepare to confirm some from our own parish, I remember that as a young man of about 13 or 14, being taught that at my baptism I was made a member of Christ, a child of God and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. A member of Christ, a child of God, and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. And these were claims and statements which I had learned, which I had memorized, and I had learned them through repetition, just saying them over and over and over again. And friends, as is the case with most things that we learn through this kind of rote memorization, I could recall them, I could repeat them, and I could repeat the details quite clearly, but I do not know that I really understood these claims at the time. For me, truly comprehending that I had indeed become a member of Christ, a child of God, and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven was something that I had to grow into and appropriate and appreciate over the next decade, I would say, of my life. It came through an experience while I was visiting another Christian community with a friend at the time. It also came through my association with Christian friends that I had made and come to know through university. But what I came to understand was that the promises of Jesus Christ in the gospel were not just for me to know and to memorize, but they also required a response from me. His life had a claim and has a claim upon my own, and indeed upon all humankind. And so through an awakening to God's grace, an awakening of sorts, I came to encounter more and more this living God of Israel who comes in search of us, this God who comes to encounter us in a relationship with him beyond the pages of the text, beyond what we memorize through repetition. Today we commemorate the Feast of the Epiphany of our Lord. That is, the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles as it is depicted by the arrival of the wise men from the East in our Gospel reading for today. We are told there that in the time of Herod, the wise men observed in the heavens the star of this one who would become king of the Jews, and that guided by the star they came to Bethlehem of Judea, to the place where the child was, and they knelt down and paid him homage, offering him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
In other words, friends, if we listen carefully to this text, we will realize that those who were not Jewish by birth and who had no expectation of a Jewish Messiah, it is to them that was made known that this Christ child who has been born King of the Jews, that this babe whose life would be manifest, manifested as the light to all people, it was made known to them. And so every time we read, every time we listen to the account of these wise men, it ought to be a reminder to us that they are symbolic of all Gentiles. That is, you and I, all those who were not, who were once rather considered to be far off, to be outsiders with regard to the Jews. They are symbolic of us, of you and me, who have now been drawn near by the light of Jesus Christ. But how could the life of this Jewish baby be of any relevance or meaning for my own or for anyone who is not Jewish? How could his life so many years ago be of relevance to mine? And I know that this remains a troubling question for so many, particularly for those whose self-identity has been historically distorted or tainted, has been undervalued or undermined by the travesty of the North American brand of slavery. I mean, isn't it a betrayal? Isn't it a rejection of my own religious culture and my own religious heritage for me to allow and to follow a God who is proclaimed by some other people and some other culture or heritage other than my own? Isn't that a betrayal? I mean, historically speaking, as you and I know, human cultures and heritages have had a tendency to think or to speak of God in ways that are reflective of their own culture. And this was even true among the Jewish people of Jesus' own day. But friends, the God who is manifested to us in Christ is the God who subverts all cultures and all heritages. For he is not simply a man born into Jewish culture and heritage, but he is also fully the eternal son of the living God. And that is what makes all the difference. And so we affirm that we as human beings, rooted as we are in our various cultures and heritages, we do not find our way to God. Because in Jesus Christ, friends, God has found his way to us. It is in fulfillment of the promise that Israel would be a light to the nations. For in him, we confirm and we proclaim that the light has indeed shined. And that light was and is the light of all people, not just the light of Christians or of Jews. Our readings for today, particularly the reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, point us to an understanding of epiphany in another sense. That is, to a moment of sudden or great revelation, as many of us uh, are probably more familiar with, right? When we come to recognize that Jesus' life has a claim not merely upon Jewish lives, but upon every human life that Jesus' life truly does have a claim upon your life and mine. That is an epiphany. When you realize, friends, that his life is not just good news for someone else, but that it is also good, you, good news for you and for me. And this is the sense in which we might say that the light bulb came on, right? Or that the penny dropped. This is the kind of epiphany that I was alluding to earlier in terms of my experience while visiting other Christian communities and through my associations with friends in university and at college. The light bulb came on, and I recognized that his claim also was a claim upon my life, that that good news was good news for me too. And so in this understanding of epiphany, there comes a point when the fact of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us 
becomes the central determining factor for how we live this life. And friends, let me say this to you, that this is much more than about just being nice, all right? I mean, we like to be nice to other people, and it is important that we are nice to one another. But you don't need Jesus in order to be a nice person. This is about learning to recognize that much of what we so often come to love in this life is, in fact, shrouded in darkness. There are hints and tinges of sin. And so this is a process that is coming to follow Jesus as Lord. This is a process which doesn't always feel nice. Neither will we always be seen by others as being nice people, and we need to get comfortable with that as well. There are many in Jesus' lifetime who did not consider him to be a nice person. He was not nailed to the cross for being nice. He was nailed to the cross under the charge of blasphemy and for being a troublemaker. And so acknowledging that this Jesus is, in fact, the central and determining factor of how we ought to live entails also for us, friends, a process of learning what it means to walk away from that darkness, whatever that might be, and to walk into his marvelous light day by day and moment by moment. And so Epiphany, in this sense, points to that ongoing experience within the life of of the believer, where, like the wise men, we are drawn step by step and moment by moment, we are drawn more and more to the light that is Christ's life. Because you see, to be drawn by this light, friends, is to be transformed by the light. It is to be sanctified, that is to be made holy by the light. And so yielding the central place in our lives to Christ means that Christian life is not merely a matter of how I live, but rather once that light bulb goes on, we realize that it is much more profoundly a matter of how we actually see and interpret this world around us. Our gospel passage from New Year's Eve just a few days ago, reminded us that both the sheep and the goats encountered the very same reality. They encountered the hungry, they encountered the thirsty, they encountered the naked, they encountered the sick and the imprisoned. But while the sheep saw and interpreted them as the least of these, of Jesus' family, who were in need of God's loving care, the goats, on the other hand, saw and interpreted them as those who could simply be ignored. So my sense, friends, is that both kinds of epiphany are needed in the life of a believer. We need first to be drawn to the light of this one who was manifested to the Gentiles, thanks be to God, in order that we may, secondly, be in a position to acknowledge the claim that he has upon our lives, upon you and me. And I suspect that even within the church, most of us would readily acknowledge that first kind of epiphany, that Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph and that his life has importance for those who are Jewish as well as those who are non-Jewish. But I also believe that for many of us, the struggle lies with the second kind of epiphany, that is, recognizing and acknowledging the claim that his manifestation has on us personally, that it is not just for someone else, but that it is for you and it is for me. And friends, this is a good and gracious claim. This is a loving claim. Your life is not your own. For through the gospel, as we have been reminded on this day, you have been made fellow heirs of Christ, members of the same body, and sharers in the promises of Jesus Christ. May God grant us grace this day 
to walk from the darkness that our lives entail into his marvelous and loving light. Amen.